Signed, sealed, and soon to be delivered. Baylor's 2023 recruiting class is complete at the end of late signing day. Where do you grade it? This is Locked on Baylor. You are Locked on Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Baylor. Drake Tolpin, Sports Illustrated's Inside the Bears here, breaking down the 2023 recruiting class for Baylor football. Thank you for making Locked On Baylor your first listen every single day. I hope I'm looking out the window right now. Baylor's not been in class like at all this week, by the way. Uh, and I don't, it has like not worked out very well for anybody involved because it's just rain. It, there's no ice, there's no snow where I live over by campus. So weird, but not weird. Thank you. Did I already say thank you for making this your first listen every single day? If I didn't, there. Um, not weird as Baylor's recruiting class in 2023. Not as good as it once was, you know. You lost Austin Novosad, Tori in York, Christian Braithwaite. You lost a good a good group of guys who are going to be really solid out of this class. You did, you did. But you made up for it with Sawyer Robertson. You made up for it with the Barrington bros in the offensive line and Isaiah Dunson in the secondary. I still think there are holes. Dominic, Dominic Richardson at running back, too, goes, I mean, like, you got to mention that guy. Uh, still don't think this class shapes up to be exactly what we thought it was going to be. Baylor finishes around 34 in the country, number 34 recruiting class. Uh, the transfer portal recruiting class is like 32 or 34, somewhere in that range as well, which is very Baylor. It's kind of what David Rand has done. He's been at 36. He's been at 35. I think this one's 34. Four, so he's gotten a spot better like every year. Um, but okay, what's new? This is kind of where Baylor recruits in the last decade, or at least since Art Bryles era. Uh, and even during the Art Bryles era, you weren't seeing like a constant influx of four or five five star guys. This is this is what Baylor does. They take less and they do more. Um, and here in a second, I'll be joined by John Garcia Jr., who's going to help break it all down. We'll do a quick roundtable Q and A on what this class looks like and go top to bottom. Um, but first, I just I, I want to say, look, this this is a B, a solid, respectable B of a class. When you've got guys out of the out of the high school ranks like Bryson Washington, who I think is going to be really good from Franklin, even though he's just a three star. Matthew Kloppenstein, I think is going to be really good from Arizona, a big tight end. Um, then when you look at uh, when you look at how you're going to bolster your offensive line, which I still have a lot of questions about, and you go and get a guy like Isaiah Robinson from Arlington Lamar, six foot seven, three hundred pounds, he's going to be a huge addition. Lavar Thornton Jr. from Timber Creek, the cornerback position, he could get playing time next year because that unit needs some help. I mean, look, this is this is a good B. You lost Austin Novosad, your crown jewel. You lost Braithwaite. You lost York. Both of those guys were four-star. You lost one to AM and one to LSU, so you know you're doing something right, but you still lost them. You made up for it with the portal. You made up for it with some a, a couple of respectable four-star kids, but it's a good B. It's a good B for this class. Now, John Garcia Jr. will join the show, and let's go through this class in its entirety. We'll be joined by Jordan and John now. It's National Signing Day across the college landscape, and Locked On has you covered with the latest for your favorite college teams. I'm Jordan Black, and it is time to look at the class for Baylor. Alongside recruiting expert John Garcia, we welcome in Drake Toll for Locked On Baylor. Drake, let's talk a little bit about the quarterback room for Baylor. There's going to be a quarterback battle and I want to know if the quarterback for next year is going to come out of this recruiting class for 2023. Yeah, Jordan, I, I think everybody at Baylor really wants to know that right now, myself included, because it's 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 right there in front of you. Blake Shapin is a 15-game starter the last two years who has given Baylor a lot of really solid minutes uh, and given Baylor a lot of really bad heartbreak. And so Bears fans generally are, are ready to move on. But the coaching staff has has ridden him out. They have allowed two or three guys. I say allowed. They, they've seen two or three guys transfer out of this program because they've stuck with Blake Shapin. And now they've brought two guys in and Sawyer Robertson from Mississippi State, RJ Martinez from Northern Arizona. I don't see Martinez making an instant impact, but Robertson could be the guy to dethrone Blake Shapin if this staff feels as though Shapin's just not delivering. Because a lot of the fans feel that way, and and you see it—a six and seven record coming off of twelve and two and a Sugar Bowl victory with a Big 12 title was not what Bears fans were expecting. And if you're going to point blame on somebody, they say the most popular guy in town is usually the backup quarterback. And that's what it felt like this year. So if Sawyer Robertson steps in as if there is one crown jewel of this class, it'd be him because he's the de facto four-star QB that everybody wants to talk about. 
if he's able to step up and make a big impact, not only could he make a spring football QB competition interesting, he could take the position outright and be the guy for the Bears next year. And I think a lot of people want to see that. So much of the recruiting game nowadays is going into the transfer portal. And Dave Aranda usually isn't the guy to do that. So kind of a change in strategy this year. Tell us a little bit about what he did in going to the portal this year and how that makes up this 2023 class. Yeah, Dave Aranda is an old school ball coach. If you're going to go and look at somebody's Twitter account for entertainment purposes, please don't go to Dave Aranda's. He is he's not great at the whole bells and whistles there. And and that's shown in his first two years in the transfer portal. Really only took five guys. And then this year he took 10. He's plugging a lot of new holes uh, that the defense has, especially with new defensive coordinator Matt Powledge coming in. And they lost 10 recruits this offseason. They they lost a few guys to transfer portal as well. And Aranda had to turn somewhere for immediate impact players. And he went to the portal. Finally, we've been waiting for him to go to the portal. Uh, and he did it with great success, something that I, I don't know if any of us were really expecting coming into the offseason. But he pulled in guys like Sawyer Robertson, quarterback out of Mississippi State. He pulled in Keytron Jackson coming out of Arkansas, who's going to be a really solid wide receiver for Baylor next year. I love the Barrington brothers, two offensive linemen from BYU. Clark Barrington was someone who I thought could have gone to the NFL draft this offseason. Many were ready for him to do so. And instead, he'll start for Baylor next year in the interior of the offensive line. Dominic Richardson, a running back out of Oklahoma State, will likely be your starting running back next year just based on what he's put uh, on film. Six foot, 205, a big Abram Smith style back. Baylor, Baylor's recruiting class is, is built by the transfer portal because they lost so many of their marquee guys in the class 20, 2023 out of the high school uh, ranks. And so this transfer class is, is what's going to keep Baylor afloat next season. Well, mentioning losing guys, uh, John, that happens for every recruiting class. You're going to lose some, you're going to flip some, uh, but you never want to have as many decommits as, as Baylor had this year. What do you make of those decommitments and what does it say a, a, about Baylor and, and just the makeup of what's going on in the Big 12? What do you just make of the number of decommitments um, that Baylor had this year? Well, look, on the positive side, Jordan, it means that the staff is still evaluating at a very high level. You're talking Austin Novosad committed for a year before flipping to Oregon. Uh, Terry and York, a guy who really wasn't ranked when he was committed to Baylor, has a huge senior season. Now he's signed to Texas A&M. Christian Braithwaite, another versatile second-level player. He's off to LSU. So you're talking about borderline blue chip recruits that Baylor's identifying first among not only schools in the state of Texas, but among power five programs in general. So the identification and evaluation parts of the acquisition processes are great. It's just holding on, holding on for dear life at the end. And, and there's so many factors that go into decommitments for some it's waiting on that other offer. Hey, this, this is an opportunity I didn't initially consider. Now it's here. We have to do some due diligence. Sometimes it's just that simple. Other times it's about the on-field product, 2021 20, uh, Big 12 champs, 2022, not so much. You know, that stuff, that momentum that 21 created uh, tailed off a good bit. And the quarterback position, as Drake uh, so eloquently detailed, has a lot to do with it. So there's there's a, a bit of a turning point or, or, or crossroads here for Baylor on the field, and it does impact the recruiting trail as those 10 D commitments do reflect. But the front end of this thing, this machine, is still operating at a very high level. So it's about that long-term haul holding on uh, longer uh, you know, later in the game, uh, which is really, again, like you said, Jordan, hard for everybody to do this time of year. Alabama, Georgia, all these schools – deal with decommitments just maybe not so many long-standing decommitments like Baylor which again is, is more of a, a tip of the cap than something like you both have mentioned a, a number of guys by name do any of those guys stick out as uh recruits that'll make an impact in year one that will see playing time early Drake we'll start with you yeah, I, I really have liked Matthew Kloffenstein, big tight end out of Arizona. He's a borderline four-star kid who's going to bring an instant impact on the not just the offensive line, but also in the in the passing game. Uh, Baylor likes using tight ends. They used Ben Sims a lot last year, and Ben Sims is gone. So where is his replacement? Could very well be six foot five, two hundred and twenty pound Matthew Kloffenstein. Really impressed with Bryson Washington from Franklin, Texas. State championship athlete, can play running back, can play receiver, can really do it all. Diversity on offense, 5'11", 200 pounds, going to bring another big power option for the Bears. And then 
Sticking with uh, with the offense, Isaiah Robinson, offensive tackle, four star kid from Arlington, six foot seven, three hundred pounds, already has the big build. Baylor's offensive line's got a lot of questions next year. They're going to lose five starters. You, you've got you, you got to do something, and, and they're not only going to lose five starters, but their their quote sixth man in the O line is transferred, Micah Mascua. So Isaiah Robinson, you don't want a true freshman to start on your offensive line, but might just be the case for that guy. John, who sticks out to you? Yeah, I was going Zay Robinson as well. I mean, he's got to be the guy. We, we talked about uh, a lot of contested recruitments that didn't go Baylor's way. This was one that was contested throughout that Baylor was able to hold on to it. And maybe that potential playing time was something he couldn't pass up. But as Drake said, 6'7", 300 pounds, a banner left tackle who moves better than his frame suggests. And I like the polish here. You know, he's light on his feet relative to his size. And his frame is one of the best in the country, regardless of of position. So while the technical aspect and just adjusting to college football is still ahead for him in terms of seeing the field, the combination of the the need area there for Baylor and his raw traits, I do think will allow him to see the field or have an opportunity pretty much right out of the gate as a true freshman. Stranger things have happened uh, in this sport. And look, he's coming from Arlington Lamar, big time program, plays against elite competition on Friday nights. And we know, you know, the apex of, of high school football in the state of Texas is borderline college it feels like so I think Robinson will be mentally ready to go any areas that Baylor didn't address in this 2023 recruiting class that they should have Drake yeah corner a secondary safeties corners you lost Al Walcott to the transfer portal and Snacks Johnson both of them going to Arkansas together so now, what do you do to replace him? You you get Isaiah Dunson from Miami, which is a great pickup. But overall, you didn't boost your secondary as much as many Baylor fans would have liked. And you didn't put yourself in a comfortable position with your secondary that has plagued you the last couple of years. You are now two years removed from the Jalen Petrie era of Baylor football. And you haven't seen a guy step up and play the role that he was able to. Now, granted, look, he, he's a really good athlete, but that's what David ran to the precedent he set was these are the guys that I'm going to develop at this university. And you can't really develop them if they're not on the roster. And right now they're not on the roster. Your, your secondary needs a lot of help. Matt Powledge was the safeties coach for Baylor's Sugar Bowl and Big 12 run. He is back as the D coordinator, brings a young spark to this team. So sure, maybe there's a lot of development you see in the offseason from guys like Alfonso Allen, who you haven't heard too much from. But right now, I just I don't understand why they didn't get a couple more game-ready guys to bolster that unit. Overall, though, we're feeling positive about next year. Can you give us a grade? Uh, Jordan, if I'm going to give a grade in this offseason, it's probably a, a, a B. And there have been times where it was it was teetering in the C minus levels because Baylor had lost so many big time commits. Uh, had you asked me in early December when Austin Novosad jumped ship, he was going to be from nowhere to a top 10 quarterback in this class was going to be Baylor's greatest quarterback commit ever. And he leaves the day before he was supposed to sign to go to Oregon. So now uh, the world's falling apart. And we're talking about Braithwaite. We talked about Tory and York. Baylor's class was bad at one point in this offseason. And then they went to the portal and they fixed a whole lot of it. They got Robertson from Mississippi State. He's going to be a staple. They got Dunson and Richardson. So, so that's what saved this group was the transfer portal. Uh, and and if Baylor is going to win next year, they have eight home games. They got a really favorable schedule. If they're going to win next year, they've got to lean on the transfer guys. And the fact you got ten of them, that brings it to a B for me. John, you sticking with a B or you got a different grade? Yeah, I'm I'm right on line there. I thought you missed on certain positions. Drake highlighted the secondary. You obviously missed that quarterback when Novosad bolted there at the eleventh hour. Didn't bring in a running back from the high school ranks either but you compensated with the portal at both of those positions. But I think quarterback bringing in multiple guys was really important here for Baylor because almost no matter how this QB battle shakes out, you're probably going to have another exit into the portal, maybe as early as the spring window when it opens back up in the month of May. So bringing in multiple guys, I think, was, was really important for sustainability. And who knows? Baylor could dip right back into the portal looking for another QB before all is said and done. But I thought being in the state of Texas, you could grab a late high school addition at the position. But it just tells you how comfortable and set they thought they were with Austin Novosad. I remember Yes, Oregon flipped him late, but before that, Notre Dame, Ohio State, Texas A&M, everybody was trying to flip this kid unsuccessfully. So 
Baylor had a reason to be confident in holding on to him, but obviously the Ducks uh, were, were too much to pass up in the end after a late visit and, and the relationship he's long had with uh, the new Ducks OC, Will Stein, who comes from the state of Texas. All right, what a fun little roundtable. And thank you to today's sponsor. I bet you could guess it. I bet you could guess it. Today's sponsor is FanDuel. FanDuel is where I go for all of my fun, safe, respectable, um, the easy sports betting and sports wagering needs. Also where I go for like, yeah, like fantasy style sports betting. They have all kinds of stuff. That's why they're America's number one sports book. Uh, they are the official sports betting partner of Locked On because they have the number one sports book in America. And if you're new to FanDuel, it's even better. Right now, you uh, do a no-sweat first bet. Put $3,000 in the Super Bowl. $3,000 on Kansas City to win. If it hits, you get $3,000. If it doesn't hit, you get $3,000 back in bonus bets or free play if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel has everything. Money lines, point spreads. Who's going to score a touchdown? Who's going to catch the ball? Who's going to do all that stuff? It's all at FanDuel. Uh, it's secure. It's safe. It's super easy to use. Best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly in the FanDuel app. Go download it today. Join FanDuel at FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's where you claim your no sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel. Yeah, all right. A B. It's, it's, look, it's a good class. It's a good class. And I'm glad that John was right around that area of a B as well. Um, this is not a, a world beater group to me. Uh, but it's it's your typical Baylor football recruiting class. That, that's not a bad thing. This is not – it's lacking in Austin Novosad, who could have been the guy in the next couple of years. But you got now your, your, your Sawyer Robertson, who's going to be really good. You lost Snacks Johnson. You lost Al Walcott. But you bring in Isaiah Dunson from Miami, who could be really good. Uh, there are pieces. You lose most of the offensive line. The Barrington bros come in. There are pieces that make this class solid it's just the fact you lost 10 guys is what keeps you away from being a b plus or an a i want to before we close out the show today which we have a good little bit of time i want to go back through the baylor football schedule for next season and hit on some other high points uh, obviously yesterday's show was an instant reaction to the football schedule so there were there was less like complete breakdown and more just oh look at this football schedule and who are the sharks um the bears have a real opportunity to utilize what I think is one of the easiest schedules in the Big 12 to win a lot of games. You, you maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm off base there, maybe this isn't easy to you, uh, but eight home games obviously gives you a massive leg up in conference play. You get uh, LIU, Long Island University at home, that's an obvious win. Texas State at home is going to be a win. I think Utah at home is still a win, uh, especially in September. Uh, and then Texas at home, some of your best opponents like Texas. Uh, is at home. You get a conference game against Texas Tech and Julian McGuire at home. Iowa State comes to your house. That should be a win. Houston at your house should be a win. West Virginia at your house should be a win. Uh, I think UCF on the road, it's going to be a cool atmosphere. You get a great opportunity to go to Orlando. Good excuse for Baylor fans to make that trip for the first time with a new Big 12 member. You get to go to Cincinnati, Ohio. Like The, the idea of Baylor playing Cincinnati on the road is really cool to me. Um, just because, hey, this is a new member of the conference, and Baylor. When's the last time Baylor played a game in Ohio against a college football uh, team, a college football playoff team from a couple of years ago, who is uh, who's trying to operate with a new head coach as well? Then you go on the road to Kansas State, on the road against TCU. Not the easiest way to round out your schedule. I wish those games were a little earlier. That's obviously the toughest part of your year. Both of those teams are going to compete for a Big Twelve title. But again, th th here's what it plays into. If Baylor is a one-loss team, number 13 in America, when it comes to November 11th and they play Kansas State and you win that game against a good Kansas State team, you got a shot to jump deeper into the top 10. If you beat TCU, who could be a Big 12 title contender themselves, you've got another shot to move up in the rankings. And then West Virginia is your... It's not a cupcake, but it's it's like one of the easiest games in the Big 12 next season. And you get them at home, so you get two tough games to bolster your schedule. And then similar to how TCU had Iowa State to round out their year last year, you get West Virginia at home, so you get an easier game where you can close things out. And look, if the Big 12 title's on the line, if you've got a shot to go to a Big 12 championship, I, I probably want to be playing West Virginia at home and not being in BYU's case where they're going on the road to Stillwater, not being in Iowa State's case where they go on the road to Kansas State, or even in Kansas's case, they go on the road to Cincinnati. Uh, you didn't draw. TCU goes on the road to Oklahoma in their last game. Texas Tech goes to Texas. I, I want West Virginia at home. That's a great spot to land at the end of the year. And one of the reasons this schedule 
generally easy. I mean, look, sure, not easy overall, but comparatively easy. I, I pointed to it yesterday. I'll point to it again. Oklahoma has got to go on the road for six games next year. They get Texas at a neutral site, though. So they they only have six home games. I guess you get neutral against Texas. Uh, you go to Cincinnati. You go to Tulsa, which is kind of embarrassing. Like, OU is playing a game at Tulsa. That's funky to me. You go to Kansas, to Oklahoma State, to BYU, and then Oklahoma's home games suck too. They got to play. Iowa State, SMU, Arkansas State, none of those are going to be marquee matchups. UCF at home, that's not going to be a really marquee matchup. West Virginia at home should be a cakewalk. TCU at home is the only really big game they get. If you have people, I saw people on Twitter that were like, oh, why didn't the Big 12 bone uh, Oklahoma a little bit more, or Texas a little bit more with their schedules before they go out? Why do they treat them so well? OU's only got six home games, and they all kind of stink. They're, none of them are good. None of them are fun games. It's like, look, this, they do get boned. They do get a, a little goodbye with here. Here's your big marquee game against Iowa State in, in Norman. Ah, and then Texas, Alabama on the road. That's not easy. They get Baylor on the road in their first four games. That's not easy. Kansas at home. Kansas is the Texas world beater. Hey, that, that's not easy. Obviously, they still get the OU game. At, a, at the neutral site of the Cotton Bowl. They go to Houston. Do you think Texas got an easy schedule? Maybe easy. This is not the toughest of all of them, but there are some embarrassing moments on here. Texas has to go to Houston. You know how demoralizing that is for the big UT fans that, oh, you know, we're so high and mighty and big and great. Now you're going to go play on the road against the Houston Cougars. That's that's funny to me. It's really funny to me. Uh, and then BYU at home, Kansas State at home, Texas has to go to TCU. That's not easy. They got to go to Iowa State. That's two of their last three games. And then Texas Tech comes to Austin. They're going to be a good team, too. The last three games, four games, Kansas State, TCU on the road, Iowa State on the road, and Texas Tech, the last five games. BYU's in there, too. Texas didn't get off easy. Oklahoma didn't get off easy. Baylor did. Baylor did. I, I just I look at this, and I see eight wins because you are playing eight home games. And if you go six and two at home, all you have to do is go two and two on the road against UCF winnable Cincinnati first year head coach winnable Kansas state uh, TCU uh, win two of those games. And you are, you are eight and four next year, whoever the quarterback is. Uh, now, look, this, this also gives you more confidence in if Blake Shapin, this is a statement, by the way, if Blake Shapin is named the starter for next year's Baylor team, I'm okay with that. No, I'm okay with that. I last year's schedule, you needed a what we thought last offseason. Think about this. What we thought last offseason was okay, you need if you're Baylor, you need to opt with Blake Shapen instead of Gary Bohannon because his ceiling's much higher. So going into a really tough schedule, which Baylor had last year, so many road games, you want the guy that's got the highest ceiling. You're taking a chance, it's a risk, and you go with Blake Shapen. It doesn't pay off. But now you don't have to be as risky. You can go with a, all right, we'll, we'll go with Blake Shapin, who we've, who's been there before, who we've had before, and the schedule is conducive enough to make him more comfortable. If he's going to take a step up, you want to do it in an eight-game home schedule that's one of the easier in the new Big 12. So look, go with Blake Shapin. You don't need to take a big chance on a guy um, with, uh, with a high ceiling. You don't need to take a chance on Sawyer Robertson if he's not ready to step up and be better than Blake Shapin. I say go into this season with it in mind. If Blake Shapin's the starter, that's okay. Based on the way this schedule shakes out, all right. There are a lot of opportunities to win games, especially at home. A lot of opportunities to win games, and the Big 12 threw you an absolute bone with this schedule. Um, and then you have the unique teams like UCF and Cincinnati, which make it fun. Houston, which makes it fun. And you get Houston in Waco, which I think is awesome. The fact that UT has to go to Houston and you, Baylor Bears, get to play the Cougars at home. Oh, it just makes me sleep so much better at night, knowing that this is what Baylor's schedule came out to this season. So there you go. Recruiting class, schedule, all of that. You know, man, all of that. Coming up this this tomorrow, I guess. We're going to do some more basketball coverage. The Big 12 race is not, uh, oh, how do I want to say it? The Big 12 race is not out of reach for Baylor at five and four because the Big 12 has so much parity. They're nine games in. If they go five and four again, they finish at 10 and eight in conference, then they're not going to be a the conference champion. But if you if you go seven and two in your last your last chunk of games and you finish 12 and six in Big 12 play, Baylor could legitimately win this conference still. That's going to be a topic of conversation over the course of the next couple months. It is February, too, meaning we are very close to March. We are almost, it's almost madness time, which I'm, oh, 
my last March Madness as a student. That's it. Baylor basketball tomorrow. Come back. Thanks for making Locked On Baylor your first listen every single day. This has been, it always will be, by the way, Locked On Baylor.